On October 25th, 2011, while on a routine field mission in Somalia, working as the education advisor for a non-governmental organization, Jessica was abducted at gunpoint and held for ransom by a group of Somali pirates for 93 days. Forced to live outdoors in horrible conditions, starved and terrorized by more than two dozen gangsters, Jessica's health steadily deteriorated until, by order of President Obama, she was rescued by the elite SEAL Team 6 on January 25th, 2012. Hello, ladies. So today I'm interviewing Jessica Buchanan, and you may remember her story um, from back in the day. Um, but before we dive into today's episode, I just want you, uh, to be aware of any trigger warnings regarding your own trauma. Um, and she tells her story in great detail. And she also shares some writing from her new book, um, the anthology from desert to mountaintops. And you can definitely check all of this out on her website at jessbuchanan.com. J-E-S-S-B-U-C-H-A-N-A-N.com. Uh, you can check out all of her details there. And she has her other book called Impossible Odds as well. And her podcast as well. We should talk about that. That's what it's ta- It's called. We should talk about that. Um, instantly felt a connection to Jessica, but I want you, as you're listening to her story today, I want you to hear the resilience. I want you to hear, you know, the, the strength of the soul and our spirit and how, when we have hope, anything is possible. And the reason why I share stories like this, um, and people like this is because, We need to understand that, quote unquote, emotionally uncomfortable, right? Being emotionally uncomfortable. um, Oftentimes, we don't know how strong we are until we need to be that strong. So we're going to dive in to today's conversation. And I want you to ask yourself, where can I dig a little bit deeper in doing the things that are emotionally uncomfortable? Where can I dig a little bit deeper in having that conversation? Where can I dig a little bit deeper in doing that thing I don't want to do? Where can I dig a little bit deeper in not using my excuses to hold me back? Um, So yeah, let me know what you think. Um, Head on over to Instagram, take a screenshot of this episode, tag me. um, Let me know what you think in the DMs. Let's dive in. In that moment, I know the whole world has gone still to make space for me to hear my internal voice, like a vacuum, empty, devoid of anything but the pounding of my life inside my own heart. But the warning, that quickening in my soul telling me something is absolutely not right here is pushed into a bottomless sea of ambiguity because it is so familiar. It takes with it any of my bravery, stealing the air that could turn into words that might just save my life. The words of others, their silent threats and subsequent implications are worth more to me, I think, than my own safety and security. Their opinions outweigh the value of my life, of my own life. They know what's best for me because they said so. In a matter of a few seconds, I'm back in that church or the classroom or my parents' living room, dark shadows of authority standing over me telling me what I should and shouldn't do. It is clear that I don't know how to question what others have declared as my truth outside of my own beliefs about myself. No one ever taught me how. I stand slowly and walk away from the battleground of my bed. I am resigned. I have lost the war within myself once again. The window that opened up for me to see that part of me only I can ever know slams shut, shades dropped with a snap, curtains pulled tight so I can't see. There's no room for light and so I am in darkness. 
That smiling girl is no longer holding her head up high, proud of who she has become and the work she has come to do. She has been abandoned once again, and knowing she is defeated, she slowly limps away to lick her wounds and take the medicine of excuses, taping up the bruises caused by decades of shame, disappearing in the silence of her own voice. Thank you. Thank you. It's the first time I think I've read that part out loud. Mm. It's hard sometimes to reread mm-hmm. your own words. It brings you back to those moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let's dive a little bit deeper to the bigger story of what that moment was about and tell the listeners. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm a I'm actually a teacher by profession, although I'm not teaching in a traditional capacity anymore. And um I spent about 10 years working in the education sector um, in Africa and from like 2007 to, I don't even know how long, um, but around uh, October 25th actually is when that this is the morning of October 25th, 2011. Um, I had been working for a non-governmental uh, organization And I was based in Somalia and and I traveled all over East Africa for this organization working in armed violence reduction and community safety. And I, part of my portfolio required me to travel to some like savory places, if you will, so a little bit, um, you know, precarious in security. Um, uh, But there was one office that we had in Southern Somalia that I was particularly uh, anxious about going to. And I had actually canceled my trip a couple of times, but was essentially bullied by my male counterpart um, to get down there and do my job or else he was going to tell on me to my boss. And I was really worried that I was going to lose my job because um, I know it's not everybody's dream, but this was like my dream job. And I was doing what I felt like I had been created to do and called to do. And I didn't want to lose my job. Um, so I got down there and, and got into the field office and, and the training was three days long. And this morning actually was the third morning of the training where we had to leave the office to move across town, which is what I was really worried about. Um, cause if something security related is going to happen, it's usually when you're in transit and I had had nightmares like all night long that night before, um, this morning that I just read about and, um, in my nightmares, <laughs> we were, our compound was being overtaken by pirates, like not like, you know, Jack Sparrow pirates, but like Somali pirates, which was actually, you know, a, a reality in this area of the world. Um, <clears throat> and I woke up, I had like, I hardly slept all night. And I remember getting up out of bed and going to the bathroom and looking at myself in the mirror. And I was just like haggard, you know, because I, I was wrestling. My intuition was like literally sending off, you know, flares trying to get me to stay behind because my mind, my body, my soul, my spirit, all of it, everything, every fiber of my being knew that if I left the building and moved across town for this training, something bad was going to happen. Um, and I remember thinking like, what am I supposed to do? Go down here and tell, like, go downstairs and tell my colleague, like, look, I'm not going to go do this training, even though I'd come all the way down here because I had nightmares about pirates all night long. (laughs) It's just like so random. (laughs) Um, so I just wrestled and, and that, that excerpt is really just like that retelling of that inner war Mm -hmm. that I was, um, cognizant of. I think that a lot of times we are at war within ourselves and we don't even know it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I definitely was not, I was 32 at the time. So definitely not as self-aware as I am now. Um, but I, I, was very, very tuned in, in that moment 
of knowing that I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel comfortable, but I'd spent an entire lifetime, you know, squashing those feelings. I I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in church, um, you know, real conservative environment, always, um, always dismissing my own feelings and thoughts and safety and, and comfort. Now it's just, you know, like the dormant doormat mentality. That's how I was raised. Um, and so I did it again and I, I put on my headscarf and I, I took one last look at myself in the mirror and I walked out the door and that was the last time I would ever look at that girl again, because in six hours, my whole life was about to change. Um, and, and so, you know, we get there, we do the training, um, and around, you know, mid afternoon, it's time to get in the convoy of vehicles and come back. Uh, and I think, yes, I've done it. I've made it. Like I got to the finish line. I just need to get to the guest house now. And then my flight leaves early the next morning. Like I'm never going to come back down here again. Um, and it was in transit on our way back to the other building um, where our vehicle was overtaken by armed gunmen. Um, and we were driven out into the desert for hours and forced to participate in a mock execution and then subsequently held hostage out in the desert for 93 days. Wow. Yeah. And obviously we're having this conversation today. So for those, we will definitely, I want to go back to the moment and talk Mm -hmm. about what I often hear from women, which is, fear versus intuition. Mm -hmm. And, but for those that are curious of that quote unquote happy ending, can you give a little bit more of those? We don't have to go into the 93 days. I know Mm -hmm. you talk, I'm assuming you talk about it in your book and all of that, but um, why don't we do that? Because I guarantee you there are moments, not just the one that you just read about abandoning yourself and like trusting yourself. Cause I'm assuming you had moments of that too within mm-hmm. your journey. Mm-hmm. So yeah, let's keep people on their toes for a second. Let's talk about fear versus intuition. Mm-hmm. Um, I get that a lot from people where it's like, yeah, I'm scared, but like, isn't, isn't freedom on the other side of fear? Mm-hmm. Like, aren't we supposed to be scared right before the breakthrough happens? Like you're doing the work that you love. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're not in a safe place, but how do you know that that fine line between this is just me being scared. I'm outside of my comfort zone versus deeply, deeply, deeply trusting yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's a difference between the fear of like getting to the other side of whatever it is, whatever challenge, whatever goal, uh, whatever the the situation is. I don't know because I believe me, I carry a lot of fear around. I have lots of goals, and I carry a lot of fear around um about those. For me, that's a, a that's a fear of failure or imposter syndrome or, um, you know, walking down the wrong path, making the wrong decision, but it doesn't impact my actual physical safety and the fear that I was feeling in the days leading up to this moment. And in, in that moment was an actual fear for my life. You know, and I, I see this, um, a lot, you know, I have my own podcast and we do a lot of, um, interviewing around like, um, criminalized survivors and, and women who have, um, survived domestic abuse. And I, I, I've been reading a lot and like in the headlines of these women who, who don't leave abusive situations. And I myself am a survivor of domestic violence. So I get it. Um, but there's a difference between like that fear of the unknown and what could possibly await or not await you and just like the fear of your own physical safety. Um, and how do we know? 
Um, I mean, I think our body always keeps the score. Our, our body tells, I think that's the difference between like what's going on in our mind and what's going on in our body too, you know? Um, and our body is like always trying to keep us safe and trying to keep us alive. Mm -hmm. Um, and so my body didn't let me sleep all night. Right. Because it was trying to keep me safe and alive because it knew what was coming. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas your mind, maybe for me, again, I can only speak to how my mind and body work, but the mind is racing and ruminating and thinking about what could possibly happen next. Whereas my body had already responded to what it knew was going to happen. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, and just speaking from my own personal experience, like literally being told like, you're going to die if, if things don't change and, mm -hmm. and the pulsating like fear of death, right. Mm -hmm. When people are like, oh my gosh, worst case scenario, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. And knowing like there were moments where I'm like, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I actually believe I'm going to die. But then there's like the, the quietness in that of like finding hope mm -hmm. and then the decisions that you make. But I also like, based on what you're saying, I remember previously, to, previous to my diagnosis, and I mentioned it in my book, I actually said out loud, what if I have cancer? Mm. And I didn't remember saying that, like it was an off-putting comment, mm -hmm. but it was like my body was telling me and I said it out loud, but I was too quote unquote busy to like listen and trust. Mm-hmm. And like deeply go in and and hear myself. So is this a skill that people need to acquire? Is it memor like remembering who you are at your core? Because um, mm -hmm. I think we all know why we abandon ourselves. Yeah. Right. Because the fear is like, what's going to happen if, if, if we go against the grain or what's going to happen if we do listen to ourselves or what's going to happen if we do put down that boundary, you know, our fear of rejection is so visceral and so physical that literally like we will do anything, even though our bodies are like, stop doing that because you're going to get yourself killed. You're going to like get stage four cancer. <laughs> you're going to get kidnapped. I mean, these are two very extreme situations, but mm -hmm. our body wants to keep us alive. I have spent so much time thinking about the development and doing research around developing our intuition, how to hone that skill. And what I have come to understand for myself is that. <clears throat> And I have this quote right here um, on my computer. I look at it 65 times a day. When you get your who am I question right, all your what should I do questions tend to take care of themselves. Mm. And that essentially is what developing the skill of intuition is about. It, in everything that we spend our time worrying about and doing and the perceptions and the networking and the clients and the, you know, the money, all of it. None of that matters. Like none of that is our concern. What matters is what we do on the inside. Our job is to get up every morning and to do the inner work, to heal the traumas, to heal the disconnect between our our inner child, like all the different phases and, and stages of ourselves and our development. Our, our job is to get to know ourselves because when we get to know who we are, what we want, what we love, what feels good in our body, what feels bad, who feels good to be around, then we know what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, part of the problem when I stood there that morning in the mirror is I didn't really know myself. You know, I thought I did, mm -hmm. but I didn't. I didn't know what I wanted. Yeah. I didn't really even know why I was there. I could tell you on paper why I was there. But looking back, I was so disconnected and so disassociated. Um, and I think many of us spend an entire life, our, like our whole life, missing out on the number one reason where you have been put here on the earth in the first place. And that is to, to develop our root system, to, to get strong and um, clear and, and, um, you know, rooted in, in who we are. Cause mm -hmm. then if we know that, then we'll know it all. We'll always know what to do. Yeah. 
Yeah. That, yes. I've been 100%. The whole purpose thing, like, what's my purpose? What's my purpose? What's my purpose? Like the obsession, the marketing, Mm -hmm. it's like your purpose is to be you. Mm -hmm. Figure that out. And that's not going to come overnight. But like, if you're on that journey of like, what feels good to me? Is it this? Is it this? Am I making this decision for my, for my parents, for somebody else? Or is it for me that coming back to self over and over and over again? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about those I keep saying 93 days. It is 93 days, correct? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about 93 days. Mm. I'm assuming you had many, many moments of coming back to you. And you, you said, I was never like that. I was never the same person again. So what's Mm -hmm. happening internally for you during that process? Well, I had this really interesting, like epiphany or, you know, if you will. And it's so interesting because like, human beings, like we're unique, but we really aren't like when we get into um, a sticky situation such as this, like we tend to follow the same pattern in order to survive or we give up. Um, I think most people want to just, they want to survive. And so they figure out, they do whatever they have to do in order um, to maintain that. And I had lost my mom about a year before this happened. And so we had lost her very suddenly. Um, and it was just really tragic and unexpected. And I was really grieving still. And, um, before I had planned, like, you know, scheduled this trip, I had been thinking about taking some time off work and I was you know, going to (laughs) like go to India and sit in an ashram or something and go find myself. And just like, I think I just wanted to go somewhere where everybody would leave me alone and I could grieve. Um, and I didn't have any kids yet and and stuff. I was married, but you know, it was, it, 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 I, I had time and, um, I woke up like, I don't know, maybe day 40 or 42. You lose track after a while. Um, and I slept outside the whole time. We were never taken to like a building or a house or even a tent or any kind of shelter. We just slept out in the open on a mat. And then we moved our mat under a tree or a bush, depending on where we were camping. And I moved my my mat from the field to under a tree. And I, at the time, was like really into yoga. So I was trying to like once like my nervous system had started to regulate a little bit. I I could like do a little bit of stretching and a little bit of yoga to try to, you know, I'm all, I was looking for things to fill, fill my time for sure. And um, I remember sitting down kind of cross-legged, leaning back against this tree and having this realization as I looked around me that I actually had an interesting opportunity because when was I ever going to have like this much time again? I mean, who knows how much time I was going to have? Like, I didn't know how long I was going to sit there and I had literally nothing to do. I didn't have a notebook. I didn't have a pen. I didn't have a book. I had like my mind and that's all I had in time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I thought, I have some things that need to get sorted out in my head and my heart. And this feels like it might be the time to do it. I don't have any, I mean, distractions. I use that term loosely, you know, because it was not a calm, safe environment at all, but there were, there were long periods of just nothingness where I was just sitting there. And, um, I thought, well, you know, like, let me, let me go on this journey then. Maybe this is my ashram, you know, didn't the Buddha reach enlightenment while he was sitting under a tree and didn't Jesus wander around the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. And, you know, um, all of the greats and leaders from all the religions, always, all of them had this period of like soul searching where they had to really wrestle with things. And it was usually like when their, their physical needs were being deprived And so I felt like I kind of fit the bill, not that I consider myself a spiritual great or compare myself to Buddha or Jesus, but you, you know what I mean? And I thought, well, let me, let me see what happens. 
So I started this journey of memories. And when I, like, I started with the first memory of like, when I was four years old, um, my mom took me to the movie theater for the first time. And I got like really, really detailed about everything that I could remember. I could remember her blue dress with the little white flowers. And I could remember that we went to go see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And like, I traveled through my life, um, like, you know, just memory by memory. And, and I, I thought about like, why, you know, well, why did I feel that way? And why did my mom react that way? And there, there was, there were some complicated emotions. Um, we woven into the relationship of me and my mother. And so like examining that, like just laying it all out essentially on my mat and looking at it all day after day after day. And then thinking about, you know, how I'd ended up in this abusive relationship when I was in my early twenties and what had led me there and how did I get out and all of the things that made me me. And it was like this really incredible and really interesting soul um, exploration uh, where I felt like I started connecting with myself again and started to get to know myself and, and really got down to the brass tacks and like, well, what do I want? And who am I? I know where I came from, but is this really what I believe? And is this really the, the, the gospel essentially that I want to preach? And, you know, and, and Mm -hmm. I came out on the other side of that feeling like I'd made a friend Um, and I think that you'll find that when you talk to many survivors who've had like long periods of time to just think and like emotionally explore, um, that is what you'll find. Um, and so while I would not want to go through 93 days of captivity again, I am also on this side, I can say I'm infinitely grateful for that time in that space because I experienced myself in a way that I don't think most people get to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that has, you know, culminated into who I am now and the work that I do now. Yeah, maybe next, you know, maybe people can go to a Vimpassana meditation yeah. retreat and sit in silence. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's why people do that, right? I mean, yes. hopefully they can do it without having guns held to their head. I wouldn't recommend that, but you yeah, know, I mean, that's, that's, that's what, that's what people who are ready to like figure some stuff out, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're, or, you know, they've just grown so tired of the way things are and the way they do it. Mm -hmm. and they're ready to level up or however you want to call it. Um, it, there is a reckoning that has to happen. And sometimes I sure it'd be nice if we get to choose that, but most of the time, like we won't choose it. No, like God or the universe chooses it for us. Yeah. Um, and I'm lucky I came out alive on the other side. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the other side, but before I do, I'm ass- I'm assuming, but you can definitely tell me if I'm wrong. Since then, I do you have moments where you're like, I can feel the next level coming, right? Like whether it's personal or professional, and then you actively choose to have reflection time rather than waiting for the universe to give mm-hmm. it to you. Um, it's like going in. Mm -hmm. it's very easy to just get in the motions of the day-to-day or the kids growing up, or you're just checking the boxes every day Mm -hmm. and then stopping. I had a moment like that last year where I was like, I just need to stop with the, everyone telling me what strategy is going to work or Mm -hmm. to do the things and just be, because I can feel that, that misalignment within myself, Mm -hmm. something new is coming. And if I don't stop, the universe is going to be like, I'm trying to get your attention. Yeah. 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 Like like I'm kind of at the point where I'm like, let's not do that. Like, (laughs) you know, like let's just do the regular main maintaining. Um, I am a, I am a very, very intentional person. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that, that inner work, like that has been the, um, 
secret sauce to leveling up and to getting clarity and information really about what I'm supposed to do next, you know, and it's not like I get the whole big picture, but I get the next step or maybe the next couple of steps. I will say I had an, an instance last year. Yeah, it would have been about a year ago. Um, I was in a, a business. I had a couple of business partners and I was not in alignment. And I knew I wasn't, I knew I wasn't from the get-go, but it was, it was like to reference what you were talking about before. Like I felt it. I was mm-hmm. not like in fear of my safety um, or my like mental health or, you know, it wasn't a toxic situation per se, but um, I felt like I, it was not in alignment to who I was and what I what I was called to do, but I, I thought, well, let me, everything checked out on paper, right? So let me give it a a shot and see what happened. Well, shocker, it didn't work out. Um, and I had like a 24 hour period where there was like a purging. And when I, I won't go into the details, but there was a lot of purging, like on all definitions of that word. Mm -hmm. And it was not pretty. And I was like, what in the hell is happening here? Um, And then I woke up, it was like an entire weekend. Then I woke up Monday morning and it had cleared all of it. Everything had cleared up and I had leveled up. And Mm -hmm. then it was like the universe just like, was like, boom, do this, boom, do this. This person came and this person came. And then like this whole idea for this anthology, this next book that, that I just read out of everything started lining up and it was like, oh, okay. All right. So I took the hard route again. I I don't consider it a mistake because I learned. So every morning for me, it comes back to like sitting in that space of like, okay, what am I here to give? Who am I here to serve? How does this feel in my body? Um, And spending that time checking in. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Deep, deep self-trust and yes. then leading from that place. Yeah. And it has, it takes time, right? Like you have to reflect and connect. Yeah. Yeah. It's a muscle. Yeah. hundred like percent. It's a life practice. Yep. Um, and people can give you the quote unquote tools to go there, but if you are not going there or doing that work, mm-hmm. um, that's something you can't do. And it's very easy to see it on people when you're like, you're not in it. You're not in it. You're, you're dancing around. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what I call emotionally uncomfortable because yes, we all know what we want on the other side, right? The freedom, the ease, the blah, 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 but you got to feel before you get there. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's go to the end. And then I want to talk about the work that you do with women in your book. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause I'm assuming people want to know about the end, the quote unquote happy ending, which I know is not like a fairy tale, but can you just uh, share a little bit about the rescue? Yeah. So um, it was, you know, day 93, uh, January 24th, 2012. Um, I had actually con- uh, gotten a really bad urinary tract infection that was moving into a kidney infection. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, if you get a kidney infection, it's bad news, especially if you're out in a desert where you have no facilities, IVs, antibiotics, a doctor. Um, and the, the, the guys that were holding me, they called themselves pirates. They weren't really pirates. They were just like, you know, crooks, bad people. Um, they didn't need me comfortable. They just needed me like barely alive, like Mm -hmm. just alive enough so they could cash me in. So, um, my, my, my health essentially, and my comfort was of no concern to them. I was a lot of pain, really, really sick, like hallucinating high fevers, throwing up the whole nine yards. Um, and I had gotten a message to our people like about 10 days before this, that I, was pretty sure I had a kidney infection and I was worried it was going to go into sepsis or something. Um, And I knew this because I'd had one before and had been hospitalized for like a week, um, like a couple of years before. And um, so, you know, I'm like laying there on, on my mat, the sun goes down in this part of Africa, like without like any kind of wavering at six o'clock. And comes up at six o'clock. So 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of darkness. So 
um, there were two stars that would come out at the same time every night, uh, really big and bright and beautiful. And I named one for my mom. And so I would talk to her every night before I went to sleep. And, you know, usually I didn't have much to report, but um, <clears throat> I remember saying this, this particular night, like, I need you to go and tell God that he needs to do something. Cause I'm like, I'm not going to make it out of here alive. Like I really am starting, I was mentally okay, but I was physically like really failing and I didn't know how to, I, there was no way I could like visualize and mentally pull myself out of this, just like science. Um, and so I fell asleep, but I woke up a couple hours later because I needed to be sick. And there were nine guys on the ground that night. Um, and always there was at least one of them that was like awake keeping guard over the camp. But this, for some, whatever reason this night, everybody was completely passed out asleep. So I said the word toilet, which is how I asked permission to leave my map. No one stirred, say toilet a couple of times, no one stirs. And I'm like really going to be sick. Um, so I grabbed like a small flashlight, like a pen light that they had given me. And I start, I hold it up and I start flashing it like this so that they can see me and know that I haven't tried to run away or escape. The stars have disappeared. It's really, really dark. There's no moon or anything. I go to the bush closest to me and do what I need to do and come back to my mat, start roll myself up in my blanket. Um, and then I can hear this like sound of like breaking grass coming toward me, like or as if something is walking toward me and it's breaking like grass. Um, and it sounds big. And I'm thinking it's like an animal or something. Like, I don't know what's happening here. I'm like trying to like wrap up in my blanket. Um, and then the night just erupts into automatic gunfire. And, um, I hear the, the pirate closest to me get up and he's like whisper screaming at everybody else to wake up and they've got their guns and they're shooting all over the place. And I'm like trying to get down as low as I can onto the ground because I'm afraid, I'm going to get shot in the crossfire, right? I have no idea who has come here. I'm thinking they're probably another pirate group or something. And we're going to get, we're going to get taken by another group. And I think that there's no way that I'm going to be able to survive being taken by another group. I just remember thinking, like coming to the realization, like I am never going to survive this. Like I am literally, not, I'm not going to make it out of this desert, am I? And I mean, guys are like, they're just dropping on the ground. Like they're breathing their last, I mean, it's just, I'm hearing horrible noises. Um, and I suddenly feel somebody pull on my legs and they, in my shoulders and they pull the blanket away from me and I can't see anything because it's just so dark out, but I can kind of make out like uh, black masks or um, like figures. And there seem to be a lot of them. <clears throat> and I'm trying to like protect myself. I have my hands in front of me and I'm just like praying. I'm just like, Oh God, Oh God, Oh God, Oh God. Um, and then I hear one of them start talking and he says my name and he says, Jessica, it's okay. We're the American military. We're here. You're safe. Now we're going to take you home. And I like kind of push myself up to sit up and all of a sudden just start shaking like head to toe, like in shock, start just like almost convulsing. I'm shaking so hard. And all I can say over and over again is you're American. You're American. What? You're American. Like I cannot, am I, there is no way my mind can comprehend what is happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, he's the same guy. He kind of gets down on my level and he has medicine. He has like clean bottled water, which I had not had in like nine or three days. Um, he says, uh, we've been watching you for a long time and we know how sick you've been. Um, and I'm just like thinking, uh, I like, I can't, I can't make any thoughts come to my mind. And one of them says, okay, do you know where your shoes are? I don't know where my shoes are. Um, he says, okay, well, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to like stoop down. I'm going to pick you up, put you over my shoulder. We're going to get out of here. We, this, the premises aren't safe. So that's exactly what he does. And he's like carrying me over his shoulder and my head's like bobbing. And all I can remember thinking is like, I'm a school teacher from Ohio. Like, how is this my life? Like, mm -hmm. how is this my, like, how do I do not understand how this happened to me? Um, and the, you know, they get to a certain point on the perimeter of the camp and put me down. I remember seeing lights. There must have been like 
I don't know, some like flash something. And my question, because I, I had been taken with my colleague, a Danish gentleman, Paul, and I said, is Paul okay? Did he make it out okay? He's sitting there to to my left and he leans over and he says, Jessica, do you know who these guys are? And I'm like, you know, Paul, I actually really don't even care. Like, who cares who they are? Like, we're safe. We're, we're, we're going to go home. And he said, this is SEAL Team 6. These are the guys that got Osama bin Laden. I'm just like, I cannot compute, you know? And so it would, I mean, it's taken me, it's still hard. Like, even when I tell the story, and I mean, I, I have told the story, I, I don't know how many times, but um, it is it's such a complete and utter miracle. Yeah. Um, there were there was no loss of life on uh, the seal side. Both hostages were um, successfully rescued. Um, nine lives were lost that night, and those were the pirates that were holding us hostage. Um, but the absolute like synchronistic stars aligning, miraculous you know, order of events that had to take place in order for something like that to go as like perfectly as it did is unheard of. Mm. Um, and so it's been 11 years yesterday. Uh, yesterday was my, uh, 11 year freedom bursary is what I like to call it. And, um, uh, not a day goes by that. I don't think about it. Think about, how hard it was. Um, I think about what I have survived and what I've learned and just how freaking grateful and lucky I am Mm. because I almost didn't get to have any of us. Yeah. It was this close, you know, from being shot, being executed, um, dying from disease, uh, dying in a car accident. Um, I could have died in the rescue. Like if, eh, you know, what, if, the pirate, one of the pirate, that's what happens a lot of times is they just shoot the hostage so that mm-hmm. there's no one to rescue. Um, when I say I'm a lucky girl, I don't mean that like tongue in cheek. I feel so, I am, I know in my bones, like I am so lucky. And then on top of that to have this um, impenetrable connection with myself is just like, Mm-hmm. all that and more. What do you think your purpose is now? Oh, I know what it is. Um, it is to use my story and use my skill set to help other women uh, connect with themselves and then um, empower them to tell their stories. So um, I've spent you know a decade essentially speaking professionally, you know, we wrote a book about this impossible odds. It came out 10 years ago in 2013. It did well. It was a New York Times bestseller. Um, and so I've spent, you know, all, all this time really like evaluating and trying to figure out <laughs> what I was supposed to do next. So there was a time where I thought my purpose had maybe like dried up out there in the desert, but I realized, you know, it had gone dormant for a little while so I could heal. Um, and I'm healing is never ending, right? Like it's, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to be healing until I'm, until I'm resting. Um, but, um, uh, my mission is to support and empower women, um, to tell their stories. Um, so many women, I mean, I talk to women on a daily basis who have just been shamed into silence, um, and, and, you know, little trauma, big trauma, everything in between. Um, and it, it does a number on our, uh, intuition and our connection with our, ourselves and, and how we show up in the world and how we show up for ourselves and for others. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so like, you know, brass tax is that I have a publishing imprint, Soul Speak Press, that only s- works with women who um, want to write memoir manifestos. So that those are stories um, where you've been through something, now you know something, now you want to teach us something. So they have to have those three components in them. Um, and then my uh, really favorite um, 
project uh, is Deserts to Mountaintops. And that is a series of anthologies. Our first one actually launched yesterday, uh, Deserts to Mountaintops, our collective journey to reclaiming our voice. Um, it's a story, it's a book of 22 women's stories who've um you know, been in some sort of their own version of a desert and have traversed out of it, clawed their way out of it to the top of their mountain. And whatever that looks like, it's very loosely interpreted, which makes it for a really cool collection of stories. And then we will be putting out another anthology in November 2023, um, Deserts to Mountaintops, our collective journey to reclaiming our bodies. Um, so body reclamation is really important to me as someone who has struggled with disordered eating my entire life and, you know, the patriarchy and all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, May 2024 will be Deserts to Mountaintops, uh, the pilgrimage of motherhood and what that journey of motherhood looks like for whether you've chosen to have kids or not, or whether you could, or you couldn't, whatever that looks like. I love it. And you have a podcast as well. I do. Um, I have a co-host. She's also a Jess, Jessica Kidwell. It's called, we should talk about that. And so our much like yours, our objective is to have conversations, even if they're a little bit uncomfortable, because we feel like, um, having those conversations helps people feel less isolated and alone. Yeah. Now, a quick break for today's sponsor, Athletic Greens AG1. I've been using them for a while now and it's become a part of my daily life. And not only that, I am absolutely loving that without trying to convince anyone in my house, they started using this too. This is the magic of developing those habits and just becoming the type of person that takes daily care of their health. Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews. It's recommended by professional athletes and trusted by leading health experts. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-boosting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit Athletic Greens, A-T-H-L-E-T-I-C, greens.com forward slash E-U for emotionally uncomfortable. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash E you to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to today's episode. I am so incredibly grateful for this conversation. Me too. Thank you. Thank you for your time and um, just holding space for me today. Mm, thank you. Thank you. And you, you actually reminded me of something. We're going to share all the details. Is there like one website that they can go to if they're like, oh my gosh, how do I find all of this that you want to let them know about? Sure. I mean, you can always connect with me on jessbuchanan.com or Deserts to Mountaintops has its own website. If you're interested in contributing as an author, we're taking submissions for um, volume two and three right now. And then I like to hang out on Instagram a lot. It's my favorite space. So Jessica C. Buchanan, and I'm like literally there way too much, but connect with <laughs> me there. It. I just realized that one of my darkest moments when I was a teen mother, um, mm -hmm. I remember sitting in the tub, wildly pregnant, 18 years old, all my friends going out, getting shit faced, knowing that I'm incredibly isolated mm -hmm. and alone. And I was reading this anthology of stories and it was, you look too, too young to be a mother. And I was reading all of these success stories of mm -hmm. women who had T uh, kids in their teens. And at the end, some of the women would be like, email me, right? Because mm -hmm. they, and yeah. I started emailing them and they were like, keep going, keep going. Like that book came out 10 years ago and yeah. I still get emails. And to this day, um, yeah, that was such a game changer. Just reading those stories, knowing like, okay, there's hope, there's hope, there's hope. And I held on to that forever. Oh, that's so amazing. I love yeah. hearing that so much. Yeah. I mean, that's what we hope you know, we've healed ourselves, I think, in a lot of ways by writing 
these stories out and then we fueled each other by working together. And then we really, our intention is that it's a tool for healing Mm -hmm. and, and, um, encouragement. So who it's been birthed, it's our book baby and we have loved it and nurtured it. And now it, she has to walk her own path. And so we look forward to seeing her journey and how, whose hand she ends up in. And, um, the stories are varied. Um, you know, there's a lot of, heavy stuff, but there's, you know, uh, alcoholism and sobriety and, and sexual abuse, domestic abuse, um, you know, a couple of postpartum uh, depression, uh, trauma stories, but they're all, they all end on the mountaintop and the mountaintop looks different for everybody. Right. And some, and, and we also recognize that there are several deserts to mountaintop journeys within us and, in and, in, in our experiences. So, um, it's not to say like, oh, we've, we've arrived you know, we've gotten to this mountaintop and we're dancing now, but we know, we know there's a desert around the corner because that's just how this thing goes. Yeah. Um, so I love hearing that. Summit, the false yeah. summit. You're like, damn it, there's another And then one. you look out and you're like, oh my God, it's the Himalayas. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Jessica. Oh, thank you so much. When I decided to leave my corporate job in December, I knew that I needed someone to help guide me. I was taking a huge risk, going back to school and starting my pregnancy and postpartum health coaching business. And the fear of failure was, is real. Heather has given me so much more than just being a guide. I'm learning how to be honest with myself, how to move through life with confidence and grace and how not to let fear keep me from the life that I want. She's pushed me to do hard things and helped me put a system in place to make sure that I have enough time for all the things that I love while kicking ass and being productive. I can be a great mom. I can go to school and build a business. Those are not mutually exclusive. I am way further along in my business journey than I ever imagined it could be, already making money, and I'm fired up by the prospect of actually starting to help pregnant and postpartum mamas feel their best. Heather's support and the community has been key in that process. You know, it can be really scary to invest in yourself, but those investments pay off.